Good morning, how are we? Good, excited, I am. Um, it's an honour and a pleasure to be here this morning, um, to be asked to chair this first session and to introduce our first keynote speaker, Mr Roy Lilly. Um, for those who don't know Roy, Roy had um, a very successful career within the National Health Service. Do you notice I'm avoiding acronyms there? Okay. Um, as it, won't <laughs> it won't last. Roy says that he wasn't aware of that rule and he won't be able to adhere to it. Um, so as a career within the NA National Health Service, as a manager and then as a chair of the uh, National Health Service Trust, um, but he's perhaps more renowned actually for his work since leaving the National Health Service um, as an independent uh, health policy advisor an analyst, um, as a writer, as a broadcaster, and as a campaigner as well. Um, he's got a large online presence, so very much go and look him up, um, follow his website, follow him on Twitter. I know Roy's already tweeted this morning a picture of the hall as you're already coming in. Um, he's also in his spare time a painter, I believe, which he does to, um, for and enjoyment. Yeah. And, a, and decorator. And decorator. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm told he's an award-winning conference presenter, not to say um, raise expectations. Um, I think his content, well, we haven't seen the slides, but I'm sure it's going to be engaging. <laughs> it's going to be thought-provoking. Oh, no. Potentially controversial. Oh, definitely. Okay. But hopefully it will generate lots and lots of debate here within the auditorium, create lots of thinking to run throughout the conference, um, and also online, you can twit, tweet uh, hashtag net2017. Um, we're allowed that one acronym, aren't we? Okay, so without further ado, I introduce you to our keynote, Mr. Roy Lilly. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, at, uh, what a fantastic building this is, isn't it? 60s, I think, is it listed? I suppose it is. It's a rather nice building. And would you mind standing up, sir? Just would you stand up, please? Yes. Uh, turn around. Look, it's Steve Jobs, look. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it's the ghost of Steve Jobs. <laughs> yeah, you wish he had his money, though, but yeah. He got his looks, but not his money. Um, uh, I, you know, coming to a university to, for someone who left school at 15 is a bit overwhelming, really. Uh, and it reminds me uh, of a lovely story about, uh, might as well start with a story, uh, of um, uh, Albert Einstein, of course, who gave us uh, E equals MC squared, the theory of relativity. And um, he, he used to give lectures in halls like this in universities up and down the country because it was in the days before... Uh, telly, of course. Um, not a lot of people had a wireless in those days, and working people really never read newspapers that much. So he would give lectures in public halls and universities about E equals MC squared and the theory of relativity. And he was invited to go to America to give his lectures. And uh, he was taken coast to coast, driven by car, to a different university campus every night where he gave the same lecture. And halfway across... Uh, he said to his driver, he said, I bet you're fed up with listening to the same lecture every night. And the driver said, no. He said, I'm not at all. It's very exciting. It's interesting to see how people react. He said, uh, I think I probably know it as well as you do now, but it's still, you know, still in... Still. So I said, well, look, I'm fed up. Uh, so I tell you what, I'll drive, and tonight you can do the lecture. Because they don't know what I look like. So, so they got to this campus, and uh, Einstein's driver, dressed as Einstein... <laughs> Uh, was welcomed as the great man. And so Einstein's driver stood at the lectern rather like that and delivered Einstein's lecture on the theory of relativity absolutely flawlessly. And it was all going terribly well until question time <laughs> when somebody stood up and asked some god-awful question about the weight of matter or whatever it was. Anyway, Einstein's uh, driver, dressed as Einstein, uh, was completely unfazed by this. And he rounded on the question. He said, I can't believe my having delivered such an erudite lecture that you would ask me such a stupid question. <laughs> he said, why, even my driver knows the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> right, I suppose you better do the NHS. It's bloody it's boring, isn't it, really? I'm fed up with the NHS, really. Um, anyway... 
I'll tell you what, well, what's happening here? No, I don't want that. That's what I want that. Um, yeah, I'm fed up with the NHS, so I thought I'd do the history of art. Is that okay? Yeah? Okay, fine. This is uh, uh, Diego Velasquez Las Meninas. So has anybody seen this? Put your hand up if you've seen it. Have you seen, have you seen it? Yeah, what did you think when you saw it? Intriguing? Yeah, big, isn't it? It's big. You get a lot for your money, don't you? Because it's 10 foot tall and 9 foot wide. It's a huge, huge canvas. It's a really interesting picture, I think. Um, firstly, its size. And bear in mind that, that in those days, the canvases had to be woven individually. So this is a seamless canvas. There's no joins in this canvas. It's, and so it's 10 feet by 9 feet. So it costs a lot of money. It's also very rich in colours. And if you look at the colours, there's reds in it, which were in, you know, you couldn't pop down you know, to the art shop and buy the colours. You just have to make them up in those days. And there's blue in it as well, which is which in, in the days when Velasque painted this, when it was 16, in the 1600s, uh, the blue is actually, most of them came from Germany at that time. And it, they were very, very expensive. So this was a very expensive to produce produce picture. The picture itself uh, is uh, Las Meninas, which means the little princesses, and you can see them here. Uh, here they are, dressed like little cakes. But it's also much more than that. It's a statement of great wealth, because you can see the mastiff dog here is, as part of the court, and there's uh, a wet nurse in the background, the chamberlain in the doorway you can see, and uh, this, is, this, this says wealth, but you see, it's nothing to do with the little princesses. It's called Las Meninas, but it's nothing to do with them. Because on the left-hand side, as you're looking at the picture, you'll see there is another big canvas, lent, as it were, against the frame of this one. And just in the shadow behind it, there's a guy that looks like the Laughing Cavalier. Well, that's Velasque. So this is a self-portrait. It's a self-portrait of a very arrogant bloke who's saying, you know, I am so, I'm such a knob, you know. I, I'm painting the royal family in this very big picture that costs a lot of money. That's what he's saying, really. But there's more to it than that, because there's another little secret in this picture. And if you look at the back, next to the doorway with the chamberlain, on the left-hand side, there's what looks like a picture. Well, it's not a picture. It's a mirror. And can you imagine how much a mirror costs in those days? And reflected in the mirror, there's a man and a woman. And it's the king and queen of Spain. So this is a self-portrait of Velasque painting the king of queen of Spain who are put in your position. You are looking at the picture as the king and queen of Spain would be if they were being painted. So this is Velasque saying, I'm not only a big knob painting very expensive pictures, but I'm also painting the royal family. <laughs> That's the story of that picture. Did they tell you that story when you saw it? No? You see, you should have taken me on holiday. <laughs> I'm real fun. <laughs> I know loads of stuff about all this crap, yeah. So that's, that's what it's about. That's, that's the picture. You like that? Yeah, it's a great picture. It's one of the five best paintings in the world, apparently. Uh, here's another one. It's Picasso. Las Meninas. He did this a lot. He reworked the great masters. You can see what he's done. Here... The great mastiff dog is turned into a little sausage dog. The little princesses are like a wedding cake. The chamberlain's still in the background. But look what he's done to Velasque. He's cut the face in half and he's turned it so he's looking at himself. It's a symbol of arrogance. He's saying what an arrogant bloke Velasque was. And the interesting thing about Picasso, of course, he, when he was, he was, his mum was an artist and his dad was an artist, and he's, he was painting you know, right in his early teens, and some of his early teen stuff, when he was painted 1920s, when he was, when he was in his 19 teens and 20s, he, um, he painted equally as well as Velasquez. He was an extraordinarily talented painter. I mean, we only think about uh, 
Picasso for the abstracts that he did. But if you look at his earlier work, he's just a stunning painter. So, and of course, what you can see there is that it's, a, it's in monochrome. The rich colors have been dropped. So this is effectively Picasso doing that to the art establishment. He's saying, you know, I can do chocolate box if you want it, but this picture's got meaning. And of course, if you look at the, what was we, in the other picture was the little picture on the wall next to the Chamberlain's doorway, you'll see that it's a picture of a clown. So he's represented the Spanish royal family as clowns. And we all know about Picasso and the Spanish Civil War. So it's a really interesting picture, isn't it, to see what he's done. You like that? Say yes, Roy? Yeah? Okay, it's much more interesting than the health service, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, and much longer have I got. Okay, right. <laughs> So, well, I mean, why have I, why have I done that? We're going to have to talk about this. But why, why have I shown you these two pictures? Well, I think it's a great metaphor for where we are with the NHS. Because the original construct and concept of the NHS was Valesque, wasn't it? This wonderful vision of a health service. And I, you know, I'm going to confess something this morning because I know you're not the kind of people who gossip. <laughs> but I was born before the NHS. Now, I normally pause there <laughs> and the audience usually gasp and say, surely not, Roy. So we'll do that again. <laughs> I was born before the NHS. My dad, my dad was a window cleaner, my mum was a shop worker, and I was born in the east end of London uh, in a, a little flat, I nearly said apartment, it was a flat above some shops. Uh, I went back there recently, it was in the east end of London, and I was horrified to find that it had been knocked down, it's a Lidl's now, and the irritating thing is that where I was actually born is the car park, <laughs> so there's nowhere for the blue plaque, which really <laughs> pissed me off, but anyway... Um, my dad had to save up the equivalent of three weeks' wages to afford to have a woman come in to look after my mum, who wasn't really a midwife at all. And uh, my mum was 12 hours in labour, no gas, no air. She had lost her first baby, so she was a woman at risk, but there was no possibility of my mum going to hospital. And she said it was worth every minute. Good old mum. Now... Two years later, of course, along came the NHS. And it took off the shoulders of working people, the worry and anxiety of maternity, injury, accidents, and illness. And it was a defining moment in our nation's history, I think. And apart from making a decision to send young men and women to war, it's probably the defining political decision of our era to give us the NHS. And of course, it was a very different NHS in those days. I mean, men died, I think, uh, when there was 68 in those days. So a pension age of 65 wasn't such a bad idea, was it, in those days? And um, w women live longer. Of course, women live longer today. And that's because men lead blameless lives and are taken unto our Lord early. That's right, isn't it? See? You're not the only academic here. I know stuff. <laughs> and what a difference it is. People used to die at home, usually over three weeks after a short illness. Now, our hospitals are full of elderly, frail people in their 80s and 90s, and God bless them, I hope they live to their 100. But it's a very different NHS. And that's the worry. Because we have an NHS which was designed in July 1948 and hasn't really changed very much since. The structures are still the same. Primary care is still the same. The front doors are still the same. Secondary care is still the same. The concept and the construct are still the same. Now, if you were going to redesign the health service, would you do it like it is? I don't think you would. 
Because if you look at it as a business for a moment, and I know it isn't, but let's think about our customers. There was a time back in those days, in 1948, when the customers were all much of a muchness. They were all sort of the same. Not, the old people weren't really old, and we all died early. So the customers were sort of the same. Now, our customers are entirely different. And if you walk down the high street, you know, you, you look at Topshop. You know what you're going to get in Topshop because Topshop designed their clothes for a certain demographic. And the door is open to that demographic. You go to Waitrose, you know what you're going to get. You go to Littles, you know what you're going to get. They are designed for a demographic. Our NHS opens its doors to everybody and it isn't designed for the way we do things now. There's a strong argument to say we should be absolutely treating elderly people, older people, in a different way to the way in which we treat them now. And I'll say a bit more about that later on. So the NHS is a very different animal. And it's facing enormous challenges. And I, and I want to deal head on with one of those challenges. And, I, and I'm going to talk about something that I know you probably don't really want me to talk about. But I'm going to do it. Because I think, with the greatest of deference to the very erudite and clever people who will be talking to you and talking with you at this wonderful two-day conference, I'm going to show you the most important slide you're going to see. This is your take-home message. Because you see, I'm going to talk about the money. This is a graph. You with me so far? See, I can do academia, see? It's a graph, right. There's a line on the graph. That line is demand. Demand for healthcare. Now, demand for healthcare, the Department of Health will tell you, is going up by about 4% per annum. It isn't. It's much more than that. I wrote a report about the future of healthcare in London three years ago, and we thought the demand in London was going up by 7%. Depends how you measure demand but it's more than 4%. Now, if we look at the money, you'll see that over, year, over the years, the money is sorted followed demand. I know that should be more of a sawtooth, but this is a, a graphic and not really a graph. But the money sort of followed what's happened. It might have been a bit late. It may not have been enough, but it sort of followed. And I want to just draw your attention to the time frame between 2010 and 2015. This is a funding cycle. The NHS gets its money in a funding cycle. They're five years to cycles, which are normally supposed to coincide with the elections. Now, in 2010, we had the coalition government struggling with the upshot of the banking crisis. Everybody panics. They turn the taps off on public expenditure. Social care had its budgets cut by 40%, 40%. It's on its knees. Now, the NHS fared a little bit better. It, it was ring-fenced, and it got a little bit of new money. It was about 0.1% a year. So, fundamentally, we had flatline funding. Now, you can see there's a gap between demand and flatline funding, and there it is. Now, that was worth about 20 billion quid. And that's quite serious. We struggled through that funding cycle. How do we do it? Well, we didn't give anybody a pay rise. We did a few deals with the pharmaceutical companies, and we fiddled with something called the tariff. That's the amount we pay ourselves for doing the work. We actually paid ourselves less. It was a fiddle. If you did it in business, you'd go to jail. But hey, it's the government. It's the National Health Service. I nearly said NHS. I'm afraid I've been struck by lightning if I... NHS, you can only get away with that kind of Mickey Mouse accounting. So then we had the next funding cycle. Now, this is interesting because the next funding cycle, we know what it is until 2020, but we've had an election in between to get strong and stable government. <laughs> and who the hell thinks that Boris Johnson should represent this country? anywhere for anything anyway so we've had 
more or less flatline funding again. The government will argue that we had eight billion up front, but over the funding cycle, it's going to be sort of flatline funding again. And as you can see, we've not only got the triangle of terror, we have the tetrahedron of doom. <laughs> the big blue bit of death. Now, economists have a word for this. It's, oh, shit. Um, because no one knows what to do. What are we going to do about the big blue bit? Because there is nothing the government can do about it. Funding is gone now, flatline funding, for seven years. And even if you wanted to make up the funding difference and get us back to something like the European average, you can't do it. Because the economy isn't doing well enough. We're only growing at 2% as a nation. Now we've got Brexit. No one knows what the hell is going to happen. We can't make this funding cycle up. So if any of you are sitting there thinking, you know what, it'll be all right when Corbyn gets in. He'll put up the taxes and we'll all be back where we were. You won't. You can't claw this amount back. Next year, the amount of money that we spend on the NHS goes down. We'll be spending about 6.3% of GDP. We used to be around the European average of about 87 You can't make that up. There isn't enough money in the economy. They're talking now about taking the pay cap off to give nurses a pay rise. Great idea. 1% pay rise for nurses, about half a billion quid. I don't know, how, I don't see how we can afford it. So the reason this is the most important slide you're going to see is you need to start thinking about the big blue bit of death. What happens about the big blue bit of death? Because we can't fill it up with money. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can't fill it up with money. We have to fill it up with ideas with innovation, with approaching the health service differently. And even then, we won't make it up. And there is only one thing, I think, that could resolve this. One thing that we really need to think about all the time to see if we can resolve this big blue bit of death. And here it is. We need more sex. It's an acronym. I'll get to it. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, somebody said to me the other day, you know, you're right about that. And I said, why? He said, do you know about the dependency ratio? I said, no. He said, well, it's interesting because society needs to have more young people than it's got old people. You need more people under 16 than you've got over 60. And for the first time, two years ago, in this country, we've now got more people over 60 than we've got under 16. So it was really a good idea to get all the Polish plumbers coming over and working with their families because we needed the young people. And now we sent them away. And they can't come anymore because we're Britain, British Bulldog, White Cliffs of Dover, we're going to go and set the world on fire and flog them cars and fridges that they already make themselves. So, you know, we're looking at a really happy future, really, one way or the other. So we need more young people, really. We need to make more babies. You've got a bonk for Britain, really. <laughs> it's your patriotic duty to go home and do it for Britain. You've got to say to your partner, this is for Roy Lilly, this one. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're saving Britain. <laughs> I, anyway, this is, I, this is just to remind me of the three things I wanted to talk to you about. It just turned out that you spell that. I thought I'd leave it like that. So, first of all, I want to talk to you about staff. I want to talk to you about people. That's what the S stands for. Staff. People. Have, are we doing this right? You're, you're the educators, aren't you? You know about this stuff. Are we producing the kind of people that we want to help us fill up the big blue bit of death, 
with an NHS that's been structured pretty much as it's structured since 1948. Because if you always train people to do the same things, the work will always be done in the same way and you will always get the outcomes and what we've got now. And you have to ask yourself, is that right? I mean, as I understand it, there are 17 places where you can learn to be a nurse. 17 places, accredited places. And there are 17 curricula. Now, call me old-fashioned, but wouldn't it be a good idea if we all taught nurses, like with one curriculum, so you knew what they'd been taught? You could see how good they all were. And when they arrived on the ward, you didn't have to retrain them. Because all the chief executives that I talked to about young nurses coming on the ward, they said, well, we have to start again. So are we doing the right kind of training for staff? And I was in Holland just recently, and I came across a company called Bertzog. Do any of you know about Bertzog? Put your hand if you know about Bertzog. Yeah, one or two of you know. It's a, it's a fantastic idea, isn't it? Bertzog. Google it when you get home. I'll spell it for you. You can only do this once. It's B-U-U-R-T-Z-O-R-G. Bertzog. That's how you pronounce it. How you spell it? Fantastic company. Now, what do they do? Well, they're, they're, they're a business, they're a company, because the system's a bit different over there. But the fact it's a commercial company is neither here nor there. What they've done is they, they have trained community staff to deal with the whole of the needs of the individual. They've said, what, what do we actually need these people to do? So instead of, you know, when my mum was alive, she used to say, God, I said, what kind of a day have you had? And she said, oh, she said, it's been like Waterloo Station here today. Everybody's been in. I've had the breakfast people, the rising service, the bathing, the chiropodist, the whatever. And she like this whole litany of people who's come and knock on the door. Now in Birdsog, they do it differently. They've trained the nurses, community nurses, to do tissue viability, to prescribe to do hairdressing, to do bathing. They do the shopping and they do the cleaning. Now, I was talking to some nurses the other day about this and one nurse said, I don't do my own cleaning, I'm not doing anybody else's. <laughs> it is possible to train a nurse and put her on the ward and she has no real experience of dementia. But well, we've got 800,000 people with dementia. It'll be a million by 2025. We don't know what the hell to do with all these people. And we certainly don't look after them very well. So when I look at organisations like Burtzog, I, I, I start to think, are we approaching training in the right way? Are we really training the staff to do the jobs that we will need them to do in the future? And I'm not sure we are. Because what we do is we train people and train people and train people and we train them all a mile deep and an inch wide. They're specialists. Everybody wants to be a specialist. When actually what we really need is our people trained a mile wide and an inch deep. The Burtzog nurses know enough to know when they don't know enough and they will get someone else in. But it's a very clever system. It's even more clever because there are no managers. It's only run by a chief executive and a finance director. The rest are self-managed teams. And there are 12 people in a team. It's a really fascinating model. And so when I look around at the, the kind of healthcare that we're delivering now, is it really conceivable that we could teach people to be both social workers and clinical carers? Can we do both of those things? Because as our customers get older, they need both services. And when I visit wards, I visit hospitals a lot, I go there and they say, hey, getting on, I say, fine. And they say, you know, what are your delayed transfers? Of care? Oh, well, we're waiting for social services to do a care package. Average wait for a care package, six weeks. We should be doing that stuff, shouldn't we? We should just be looking after people. What's the difference between primary and secondary care? I don't know, I'm a patient, I just want to be cared for. 
So it looks to me that, that this whole education thing is just completely and utterly bloody useless. Because we're giving people loads of knowledge, but they can't do the stuff that we need them to do. And if you were going to design the NHS today, you wouldn't design it like it is. It's madness. I dropped it. I was in the gym. I dropped a weight on my toe. I had to go and see a specialist. Broke my toe. Hurt my ankle. I said to him, what do you think about that? He said, you dropped a weight on it. It's knackered. I said, thanks. I said, what about my ankle? He said, I don't do ankles. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, you'll have to see the specialist up there. He does it. Ankle specialist. Four inches away. <laughs> three miles down the road. What are we doing? Which brings me to the E. It's a great word. There might be one or two people in this audience who are old enough to remember when the government ran the airlines. Put your hand up if you remember that. British Overseas Airways, yeah? And BEA, British European Airways, wasn't it? Yeah, you remember that? The government, can you imagine the government running the airlines? I mean, the government can't run anything, can they? I mean, most governments are stupid and inept and just want to get re-elected. They don't actually do anything. But the government used to run the airlines. It was horrendous. So Mrs. Thatcher came in. And she privatised the airlines. And she got a guy in called John King. At the time, John King was like a big business figure, kind of a Branson figure, I suppose, in his day. But he was from corporate Britain. And she got him in to nationalise the airlines. And I interviewed him just before he started. And I said, well, how are you going to do this then? Because you know, none of us really understood what nationalised and privatisation was. How are you going to do it? He said, I'm going to teach them that the customer is king. Ha ha. Because his name was King. You see, it was a joke. <laughs> it wasn't very funny then. It's not very funny now. But that was, the, that was the kind of guy he was. Customer is king. And then I interviewed him a bit later on. And I said, how are you getting on with the customer is king, John? He said, oh, forget it. He said, the customer is God these days. Because not only have British Airways and BOAC been national, uh, privatised, but they did it in Portugal, and they did it in France and Germany. So all these national airlines had become private. The competition was unbelievable. And then he retired and he, he had a very nice dinner in the House of Lords, which I was fortunate to go to. And I said to him on the night, I said, well, you told me once the customer was king. Then it was customer is God. What's your reflection now? He said, you've got to be entwined with your customer. Entwined with your customer, be and he's right, you know, because now we've got uh, EasyJet and that dreadful Irish bloke that runs the airline. Was it Ryanair or it's, it's, it's horrible? Don't fly with him. Um, it and the whole thing had changed. The whole thing had changed. Entwined with your customer. I thought, what a great word. That's my E. Entwined. We have to be entwined with our customer. We talk about then we 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 say we're going to make this. What are, the, what are the words they use? Something like, you know, uh, a patient-facing or focus, patient-focused services. What the hell is the use of an unfocused service? And you say, I see it all the time at conferences. You come to a conference like this and someone will stand at the lectern and they're saying, I'm going to tell you about our community bunion service. And then they put the slide up. And there's a little old man in the middle and around it, they've got all the. We've had the. We've had a, a multidisciplinary stakeholder meeting, and we've got we've all come together, and we've designed it. Uh, and it, no, all they're doing is more of the same. They're not redesigning services. If ever you're at a conference and someone does the donut slide, you're to come up on the stage and stab them. It's not killing, it's culling. <laughs> it gets rid of stinking thinking. We don't want stinking thinking. 
what we want to do is we want to start with the patient and work backwards. And that's a very uncomfortable thing to do because you figure out a lot of what you're doing is not what you should be doing. Who is that football? Uh, Fabrice Moember. Do you remember Fabrice Moember? The, uh, the uh, footballer had a heart attack in the middle of a game. Do you remember that? I met him on a TV show thing. Uh, he's a lovely guy. He's never played football again, but he's a really nice lad. He's got a couple of kids now. Very grateful to the NHS. He had a heart attack in the middle of a game. Now, if you're going to have a heart attack, you really want to choose where you have a heart attack. And in the middle of a football pitch it, uh, on a Premier League game, it's actually not a bad place. I mean, I live in, in Surrey. Can, anybody here from Camberley? And, anybody here from Surrey? Anybody from Surrey? No? Really? Oh, you from Surrey? Where are you from? Guildford. Yes, yeah, it's not really Surrey, darling, is it? <laughs> It's not proper sorry, is it? No, I think my driver lives there. I don't know. <laughs> do you go to the Meadows, Marks and Spencers, shopping? I bet you do. Tell the truth. Sometimes, yeah. You're there every week. I know you are. And in the, on Marks and Spencers, on the walls in, in our Marks, where they've got these big yellow defibrillator things, you know? And uh, I don't think anybody knows how to work. But it's a great place to have a heart attack, really. Because most of the staff that work there, the women's staff there, are ex-nurses. Um, because Marks and Spencers, they pay better. They really value their staff. And you get 20% off your knickers. I mean, what's not, what's not to like, really? You'd work there, wouldn't you? I would. Yeah. And anyway, if you have a heart attack and you don't like it, you can take it back and get another one, can't you? I mean, it's, a, it's a great idea. Anyway, so Fabrice Munner has this heart attack in the middle of a pitch. And now it, they've got a fully prepared ambulance paramedic team. You have to at these uh, Premier Games. There was a cardiologist in the crowd. He came out and helped. A club doctor was there. It was all going terribly well. And um, what happened was they put him in the ambulance. And there's a huge round of applause as they drove him off the pitch carefully. They didn't scream with a blue light. They drove past two hospitals and took him to a cardiac unit where they saved his life. They didn't take him to the nearest hospital where an exhausted junior doctor who'd never done a heart attack before fiddled about with him and he died. He said, oh, he had a heart attack, he died. No. We started with the patient and we worked backwards. What is the best we could do for this guy? Well, first of all, we want the paramedics and we want the jab to stop him blood clotting and all that. And we worked backwards from there. And when you work back from there, do we want to take into an A&E? Well, actually, no, we don't. We want to, it's not the building, it's the person. Where can we be sure there will always be a cardiologist? Well, you can't have a cardiologist on call at every A&E, but you can have cardiac centres and stroke centres, so you put all your best stuff in one place. Now, that caused mayhem when it was first mooted as an idea. And a very brave lady, uh, uh, lady uh, Dame Ruth Carnell, as she is now, she was in charge of uh, NHS London. And she went to places like Guy's Hospital and St. Thomas's Hospital and said, you know what, your cardiac outcomes aren't good enough. We're going to close your cardiac unit. Can you imagine saying that to St. Thomas's Hospital? Oh, yes, they said, please close it. No, they didn't. No. And it's interesting because look at the terror attack that there was on Westminster Bridge. Dreadful thing to happen on the bridge. Parliament one end, St. Thomas's Hospital the other. Seriously injured people all over the bridge. Ambulances came. Where did they take the patients that were seriously injured? To St. Thomas's Hospital on the bridge? No. They took them to King's College. Because it's a tier one trauma unit. Now when you do things like that, you not only upset a lot of people, you not only move the buildings around, but you change how people approach the job and how they're trained. And it's really interesting. If you start with a patient and work back. Now look at our hospitals. Our hospitals are full of elderly, frail people. What happens? They get a UTI, don't they? Bit of hot weather. They don't drink enough cups of tea. They get a UTI, fall over. A neighbour comes in, panics, rings three nines. The ambulance comes straight into A&E. Busiest, most confusing, horrible place on earth. You put your frail, elderly, confused people in there. The ambulance comes in eight minutes. Result. Old lady's sin in three hours and 59 minutes. 
within the four hours. Result. Start with the patient and work back. Is that really what we want? Is that really a result? I don't think it's a result. We've hit the target, but we've missed the point. What we really need is to take our old lady's silver service, don't we? To a geriatric unit where they're seen by a geriatrician in 20 minutes and social services in four hours and their exit is planned on the day they arrive. And we don't have OTs doing an assessment. Got to come down to the assessment centre where they have a little Mickey Mouse set of stairs like that where your granny's got to go up and down. And they have a teapot and a cradle thing. And they have a door. Open and close the door. That's your assessment. OT said, actually, no. Why don't we discharge people and assess them, and assess them in their own home? Discharge to assess. <sighs> Spooky. But they're doing it. Doing it in Northumberland, up in your neck of the woods. They're doing it. And the OTs turn up with a bloke. And she says, you'll have a rail there, perch install there, whatever here. Change the bloke gets his electric drill out, puts the thing on the wall, done. Because people have much more acuity in their own homes than they have when they go up and down a Mickey Mouse set of stairs. And it, re, it refocuses, it changes the whole approach to how we deliver care. An OT with an electric drill. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> how do we get away with that? Start with a patient and work back. It demolishes things. It not only redesigns the job, it redesigns where you do the job. And it redesigns how you do the job and who does the job. Little old lady has a UTI. She's found collapsed. Neighbour rings, 999. Paramedics come. We know she needs rehydrating. We know she needs antibiotics. They put the drip up, give her the antibiotics. Healthcare assistant comes and sits with her for four hours while the drip goes through. She sits and reads the paper. Maybe does a bit of washing up. Looks for a few trip hazards, moves some stuff about. Reads the Daily Mail. Four hours later, she takes the drip down and goes home. Can we do that? Well, if you train a healthcare assistant, you can do anything. If you think about that, little old lady gets picked up by an ambulance, taken to hospital. She's in hospital for three weeks while somebody bugs about trying to get a care package for her. Total cost, about £25,000. Healthcare assistant sits there for four hours, £10 an hour, plus on costs. Whole thing's done for about 80 quid. See? You train people differently, you get a different outcome. And you start to think how we can fill up the big blue bit of death. X. How am I doing for time, all right? Yeah? Oh, I'll do. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, X. What's the X? Well, the X is about the, what I think is the X factor for the NHS. It's about data. It's the expert. We don't use data enough. We have the best, most complete set of public health records going back to 1948, primary and secondary care. We don't access it. Because Dame Fiona Caldicott has written two reports and frightened everybody. I nearly said shitless, but you know what I mean. Everybody's terrified of data. They say, can't do that. It's the Data Protection Act. It isn't. People are just terrified to share data. I went to Liverpool, look at Healthy Liverpool program. They do share data there, but they've got 3,000 data contracts with inter interrelating with GPs and all the other. 3,000 agreements to share data. It's impossible. But data, I mean, the supermarket, who's got a, a, a card? Who's got a loyalty card? Put hand, got a loyalty card? Yeah, okay. Tesco's loyalty card? Yeah, okay, yeah. Sainsbury's loyalty card? Waitrose loyalty card, yeah. Oh, Guildford, yeah. yeah. You got a Waitrose, and all for your free cup of coffee. Do you get your free cup of coffee? Do you like a treat? Yeah. You're all bloody balmy. You know, you tell them who you are, where you live, and give them your date of birth. That's all they need, they need to know. It's all they need to know. Because they not only then know when you go shopping, 
know what you buy. They know how you go around the shop because they know where the stuff is in the shop. They know what you buy, so they know your pathway around the shop. It's amazing what they know. I, I, I did a conference. My agent rang me. She said, do you want to do a conference on data? I said, no, it's boring. She said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I don't want to do it. She said, it's at Chelsea Football Club, and during the lunch hour, they're showing you the player facilities. I said, how much? <laughs> she said, what, the fee? I said, no, I'll pay. How much? <laughs> So I did this, and it's a company called TNS Acorn, very clever people. What they've done is, the problem with data is some of it's in a circle, some of it's a square, and some of it's a triangle. Crunching it all together is very difficult. But they managed to do it. And they'd taken the, the, the uh, shopping data, plus a lot of other data. So you know when you, you go online, you buy something, and you tick the box, you know, terms and conditions and all the rest of it. You know. Actually, you need to read them. It's amazing what the data is they collect about you. Amazon know everything about you. It's really clever. So they put all this data together, and I, and I, they said I had to do a technical rehearsal the morning before. Went to the technical rehearsal and plowed through the slides, and they said, right, we're going to demonstrate the granularity of this um, by analysing a postcode, but we'll do it overnight, so it's very up to date, and it will pop the slide in. You just read it off the slide or the auto cue, you'll be fine. I said, okay, fine. So I turned up, scrubbed up, got myself down to Chelsea, plowing through the slides. I said, and now I'm going to demonstrate the granularity of our data because I can be posh if I have to. So I come from Camberley, darling, not Guildford. And uh, so I'm, I press the button, up comes the slide, GU153TS. That's a proper postcode, by the way. GU15, darling, not GU16. Isn't it? Yeah. So up goes the postcode, GU153TS, right? I thought, that's familiar. Shit, it's my postcode. They knew everything about me. They knew when I went shopping. They knew what I bought, how much I drank. They knew the car that I drive, where I get my petrol, where I've been on holiday, who I insure my car with, the fact I like strawberry-flavoured condoms. I mean, they knew everything about me. It was just amazing. And do you know what? I don't mind. I don't care. Because it means they can get the stuff that I want, a price I can afford in a place I can get to. The NHS could do that. We could do that with the data, but we don't do it. The questions we need to ask is, what makes people sick? What fixes them up? Does it work? What does it cost? And can we do it again? Do we want to do it again? Five simple questions. We can't answer that, but we have the data. We could do it. We've got to fill up the big blue bit of death. And we won't do it with our current attitude to data. What about uh, when you go shopping? Who likes the um, self-checkouts? You put your self-checkout there? Right? Who doesn't like the self-checkouts? Okay, fine. I suppose you send the butler, do you? And Guilford, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Who doesn't like them? Shall I tell you what? Yeah, it's interesting. You're in an absolute minority. I, I have done some work for one of our big um, supermarkets. I can't tell you which one it is because I signed a confidentiality thing, but every little helps. And um, <laughs> I... Uh, <laughs> uh, I and we've got in-store video where people are queuing up to do the self-checkouts and the girls on the cash desk, on the checkouts, are sitting doing nothing. It's amazing because we do it ourselves because we think it's quicker. It isn't, but we think it's quicker. And we love change when we think we are in charge. First rule of change. People love change when they think they're in charge. Yeah, I was in a supermarket the other day and the girl was on to beep, 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 and then, you know, asking the most stupid question on God's earth, you know, do you want a bag for that? I said, no, I'm going to juggle it to the car park. <laughs> she got her own back. I said, I'll have a bag for life. She said, at your age, you won't get a return on the investment. But, uh, <laughs> so. but the self-checkouts are interesting. You, you do the self-checkouts yourself and all of a sudden you said, unauthorised item in the bag in here. You think, shit, what have I bought? There are 50,000 items in Tesco's. What have I bought that's taken them by surprise? How did that happen? <laughs> Buy a bottle of wine. Authorization required. You stand there clutching a bottle of Pinot Grigio like you've escaped from rehab. <laughs> and then a child comes and authorizes it. <laughs> really pisses me off. It's interesting. It's called letting the customer add value to the business. There's a whole technology and science behind it. Let the customer add value to the business. It started with ATM machines. We do the, what the, the banks used to do. Now <coughs> you go online. You book. I was in speaking in Germany last week. I went online, booked my airline ticket, printed out my paper, my ink on my computer. I spent my time booking. I got myself to the airport. I checked my own bag in. All I had to do was to take off on time and land on time and get me home on time. They couldn't do any of that. 
everything I did was fine. Now I'm going to fly my own plane, you know. So. so what happens in the NHS? You get diabetes, you get diabetes, you know. It's a wretched thing, yeah, diabetes. And what do we do? We say, oh, you're diabetic. And then we just, we love bomb people, don't we? With clinics and websites and the way we look hard. You know, 3.5 million people with diabetes. It's going to be 5 million by 2050. We can't look after them. We simply can't do it. Any idea that you've got that GPs are going to be in the front line of long, managing long-term conditions, you, we just can't do it. We have to say to people, like the supermarkets, you're going to have to add value to the NHS. You've got, you've got diabetes. I'm really sorry, but it's your diabetes. We'll show you how to look after it, but you've got to look after it. And Here's the app, and here's the online stuff. And if you think about it, the, it all changes. So when we think about the NHS and the big blue bit of death, we won't fill it with money because we're not rich enough as a country to do that anymore. But we will fill it with ideas. We will fill it with inspiration. We will fill it if we start with the patient and work backwards and change what we do. And it's important. Because over the years, clever people have come to work and they've kept the NHS going. <clears throat> Good times and bad. And they've handed it on to us today. And now it's our turn. And it's tough and it's difficult. But we have to do it. We have to use our skills and talents to make sure there is an NHS for us to hand on to our kids and their children. The work that you do is very important. But open your mind, because like a parachute, it works better when it's open. Thank you. Thank you very much.